transmit. Let's see if this is working. Yeah, it's a, I just didn't know if that was part of the format, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. we'll try to, but people are usually like, shy, so we'll see. Okay, I think this is where we are. Let me see if it's working. It's working. Okay, I think it's working, so let's start. Um, I'm going to put this in a different layout. If I can. Okay. Okay. Uh, oh, I'm going to record this uh, with your permission, so we can have a good. Sure. All right. So, um, thank you very much, Andrew, uh, for doing this. Um, hello, everybody in uh, YouTube watching the stream. Um, today we have the opening lecture for uh, our uh, autumn in Argentina festival uh, 2024 that it's devoted to uh, the Baroque in architecture and um, to talk to Andrew Sanders. Uh, I have to say that uh, I'm very excited about this uh, not only because I know the work that uh, you do Andrew but also, uh, I admire the, the the way you approach uh, the material that we, you work with, um, and it's fantastic that you uh, can present a, a, a very and and profound and very uh, disciplined work with the Baroque uh, and a very contemporary approach to uh, the style. That it's something that we're trying to do with the activities uh, that are embodied in the festival. So uh, thank you again for doing this. Uh, I'm going to present you. Uh, I'm going to, I will try to be uh, short um, so we can start with your own presentation. So Andrew Sanders is uh, an associate professor of architecture at the University of Pennsylvania, Stuart Weitzman School of Design and founding principal of Andrew Sanders Architecture design in architecture design and research practice committed to the tailoring of innovative digital methodologies to provoke novel exchange and reassessment of the broader cultural contexts. Um, well, he received his Bachelor of Architecture from the University of Arkansas and a Master in Architecture with distinction from the Harvard Graduate School of Design. His current practice and research interests lies in computational geometry as it relates to aesthetics, emerging technology, fabrication, and performance. He has significantly uh, professional experience as project designer for ASMR Architects, Lesser Architecture, and Preston Scott Cohen. Um, well, he has taught and 
guest lecture all around the world, um, and he has been recognized. Late, latest updates on his uh, now long time research about uh, the Baroque, specific, especially specifically called Baroque topologies. Um, I won't I won't be presenting uh, longly the, the research, but I will say that uh, uh, there's a resume of the of the idea of the research that says that the area of uh, the era of uh, big data has fostered the need for new approaches to analysis and representation in all fields of design, the ability to capture, record, and simulate increasingly larger sets of data, coupled with remote access to cloud computing and progressively more affordable additive fabrication technology provides new opportunities and methods for understanding and assessing complexity and representation in architecture. Um, and Baroque topologies uh, studies a series of uh, specific uh, churches by some of the greatest architects of all time, like Francesco Borromini, Gian Lorenzo Barnini, uh, Girolamo and Carlo Rainaldi, Pietro da Cortona, among many others. And uh, we're going to see some of this work, not only the analysis work that you have, but also some of the exploration that you get to do in your uh, university studios. So thank you very much, Andrew, for doing this, and the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, uh, Santiago, for the invitation, the opportunity to uh, kind of present some of the research that I've done probably in the last eight years now. It's getting <laughs> since uh, the, the sort of major breadth of Baroque topologies was done in terms of surveying uh, around 2016, 17, and 18. Um, but uh, hopefully today I'll get to show you a little bit of that work. And then since that time, I've been working with students here at Penn each semester in a seminar and working with that material. And I'll show you some of the ways that we've kind of taken it further and explored it in a speculative realm as a way to kind of understand and interrogate these buildings and architects. Thanks. Share. Okay, great. So um, thank you for the introduction. Um, as Santiago said, my name is Andrew Saunders. I'm an associate professor of architecture at the Penn Weitzman School of Architecture. Um, this, I, I guess this series is, is titled Baroque and Roll. It was not my title, but I actually, I, I find the title quite intriguing and, and funny, so I'm happy to lead off that series. So um, as Santiago uh, mentioned, I'll just give you a brief history uh, of my kind of background where, you know, I, I not a historian in the sense, in the kind of classical sense of it. Um, I did not, uh, you know, go through, uh, you know, PhD in history in, in Baroque or anything like that. I, you know, out of school, out of undergrad, began working for Eisenman Architects, uh, working on large projects. This is one in Santiago, um, Spain. Um, also, I worked a bit with Preston Scott Cohen at Harvard GSD. This was kind of a project that I was involved in, which was uh, the Tel Aviv Museum of Art. Uh, so essentially, you know, I've come to this more as a designer. Um, and some of the the background before that, I taught at Cooper Union and then went to RPI before Penn. And one of the things I taught at Cooper Union was uh, their second year analysis class, which I always really influenced me quite a bit. It was the class that Peter Eisman typically taught. Um, when I was at Cooper, we analyzed uh, Corbusier villas for a whole semester. Students drew them, they modeled them, they worked through them without any uh, design project at the end. It was just pure analysis, pure uh, kind of close reading, enjoying the sort of luxury of academic space to explore a collection of work, an architect, and um, 
knowing it from a from a different uh, perspective than one would outside of that kind of realm of the studio design environment. Um, this is some of the work that I did at RPI, where I taught and coordinated their Rome program for builders, and they contributed a number of tools. Uh, the hodometer, which is the surveys wheel, would actually would wheel and drop a stone as they measured long distances. Uh, the diaptera, the corobates, which was a leveling device. Probably the most famous was the groma here, which is uh, you know really the origin of many European cities that were started in Roman camps. They would put the groma down, establish the principal directions, and make a grid. Uh, something like Torino still embodies that in its urban morphology. And then if we kind of go to the Greeks, the Greeks were good builders as well, but I think they were far more radical and lasting because they really took the idea of measuring and surveying and introduced ideas of deductive reasoning and the kind of uh, the, the notion of geometry, which quite literally translated is the measurement of the earth. And that's where we get the arc and the cord, which are tools used in the Baroque for um, architects, both for drawing, but then also for building. Um, probably the most important thing and interesting uh, to me is the Greeks in their definition of geometry would only allow figures that were encompassed with either a straight line or an arc or part of a circle and that was their discipline so everything from euclidean geometry is derived from either straight lines or um, some notion of an arc then we get into the familiar perspective drawing machines which were again about generating straight lines and recomposing those into perspective grids um, you know, there are a number of different devices Alberti uh, created for measuring sculpture, which are kind of predecessors of the laser scanner. And then eventually uh, the theodolite, which is an engineering tool, and then the 3D laser scanning. So the point being that this project deals with LIDAR scanning, but I think it is in the realm of architectural representation. Uh, this is a kind of quick slide showing the tool that I use a lot of people ask and so you can see uh, it's a relatively small uh, device that is placed on a tripod uh, this device then spins in 360 degrees sending out a laser and receiving the information back from that so you get a very precise measurement and a point so it produces millions of points and then it's combined with a photograph so that you embed RGB values into those points. And you know when I did the survey in 2016, 17, 18, it was a really critical point in development for LIDAR where when you survey you do a number of these kind of um, uh, point placed uh, uh, readings, and then you come back and you composite them all together. Previously, it was required that you would put physical uh, targets and spheres in the space so that when you came back to composite them, you could match them. But computation uh, had, had evolved enough to where now you can register all of these scans without doing physical targets because computationally you can recognize different similar patterns and start to recompose them. So for me, you know, in this survey that was really helpful, I could just put the laser scanning, uh, you know, device in, uh, you know, in a backpack and <laughs> go to these churches as long as I had uh, permission and could just scan there and then bring that information back without having to set up anything out in the kind of environment. So with that, I'll introduce kind of a few key figures. Um, obviously, I'm not the first person to go to Rome or go to Italy and survey. So there's a number of surveys that 
kind of influenced me and uh, and this survey. One of it, which was uh, August uh, Choisy, which this is one of his first published works where he went and surveyed the Roman baths. And what's fascinating, I mean, there's a number of things fascinating about these drawings. Um, one of which is at that time, there was a very, uh, you know, very big interest in domes and vaults. And in order to represent those domes and vaults, those interior spaces, um, Choisy really wanted a more scientific method than perspective. So he essentially invented a whole new representational um, medium for looking up into these, which was we typically call the worm's eye axometric. And you can see in these worm's eye, he was a structural engineer, uh, a French structural engineer who was really also concerned with how these vaults were structured and you can kind of see the weight of these vaults sort of coming down within the columns and kind of cut out with no ground they levitate and it's really focused on on that you know later in Chauzy's career he operates with this same uh, worm's eye axometric as a representational device to tell the entire history of architecture and his history uh, books were, you know, hugely influential on many people, especially here at Penn, uh, Louis Kahn. Uh, it's an interesting way, it's a, it's a radical way to tell the history of architecture because these warm side axons really don't show anything about the exterior of the buildings. They don't show anything about the context of those buildings. They really focus, they actually don't even show the complete buildings. They really focus on structural bays and showing the evolution of those structural bays through this worm's eye perspective uh, all the way up. You know, his history books kind of go all the way up to the Renaissance. They don't go into the Baroque, uh, you know, oddly enough. Uh, another survey of Rome that everyone is familiar with, I would assume, would be the Noli, uh, the Noli map here by uh, Giovanni. Uh, the Testa Noli in 1748. I think that most people are familiar with its black and white figure ground representation. It was one of the first scientific mappings of Rome. What people may not be familiar with, if you look at this image all the way down here to the bottom right, um, you'll see there's kind of cherub that's drawing on this rotating. Uh, uh, survey table. This was a radical device that allowed Noli to not only survey more quickly, but also survey in the fil field. And I would say that again could be a, a sort of predecessor to the laser scanner as well. But this allowed the mapping to happen quickly and accurately as well. Now, when we look at the Noli map, you'll see a number of the works that I'm going to uh, show you in relationship to Baroque churches. Um, you know, the figure ground representation seems very binary and, un and straightforward, but it's really actually more complex and more ambiguous because the interior spaces of these churches are documented in white and they're documented in the same sort of format or codification as the exterior spaces. So here we have Piazza di Popolo, which is white. It's an exterior public plaza and the interiors of these public buildings are then also white. So interior and exterior are represented in the same way, even though uh, they're very different. But what you get are these really interesting figures of the interior spaces that start to be embedded within the kind of poche of these uh, these other kind of black figures, right? Just these interior figures of this kind of autonomy of the interior. And here's a few others. If you kind of go through, here's Piazza Navono. So Sant Ivo is here. Um, uh, San Maria uh, Agnese is here. Um, there's a few other uh, Baroque churches within this sector. This one is um, probably one of the most famous uh, areas for Baroque churches, where you have on the Coronale, you have Borromini's 
um, uh, uh, church here, and you have uh, Bernini's San Andrea, and you have San Carlino here. Um, it's really interesting to go back and forth between these churches, and it's really interesting to see how very small the interior figure is in the rest of the kind of urban grid. Another more contemporary surveyor of Italy or for of Italian architecture was Luigi Moretti, who was a kind of a modernist uh, architect and and uh, teacher in Rome. He actually founded his own magazine titled Spazio, which is Italian for space. Uh, this is one of my favorite issues, uh, Spazio uh, issue number seven, where he started to look at all the Italian architecture, the lineage of that through, you know, through the lens of this idea of figuring the space. So he was making plaster models of just the interior space as figures, right? So in this sequence of uh, structures, you'll see here um, a number of the more kind of famous Italian spaces uh, um, back and forth. This is uh, entrance to uh, uh, Adrian's garden, or sorry, Adrian's villa, long entrance sequence is then modeled in plaster as a, as a solid. There's others with uh, Urbino, uh, Piazzas, uh, Farnese, Palladio, St. Peter. St. Peter is very interesting because it's a sequence of, you know, four or five major additions from Michelangelo all the way on. But probably the, the most interesting of these figures were the Baroque. Um, this one to the right is a as a Guarini church and actually an unbuilt project that comes from Guarini's uh, book. But really sort of odd figures um, in them. Also big influence on this is uh, Henrik Bolflin and his Renaissance in Baroque. And it's a really fascinating book. It's a really short book and I'd recommend it to everyone. But it was his second book right after his dissertation where he was looking at the psychology of architecture. So starting to develop an idea of formalism uh, where one could start to assess art and architecture through more uh, empirical means and looking at the kind of newly forming uh, science in terms of uh, perception and um, psychology and trying to take some of those principles and use those to assess architecture. So he writes his first book, Renaissance and Baroque, to test these principles. And in there, he really pits the Baroque kind of against the Renaissance, where I would say the Renaissance is the, the sort of good, perfect patient and the Baroque is, is a little bit um, outside of that realm. And if you look at the way that he describes uh, that uh, the Renaissance, he uses terms like elegant, harmonious, graceful, light, self-contained, individualistic, tectonic, calm, beautiful, uniform, perfect, born easily, free, complete, broad, pleasing, satisfactory, heavenly, content, uh, sorry, content, slow, quiet, enduring, and fulfilling. On the other side, the Baroque, you know, is a much more different uh, description in terms of psychological characteristics of broad, massive, heavy, dissonant, amorphous, formless, imprisoned, unevolved, incomplete, immediate, intimidating, overwhelming, exciting, ecstatic, intoxicating, momentary, desolating, anticipating, dissatisfactory, <laughs> restless, intense. And then another kind of background on the survey is I chose really what I consider the six most important Italian Baroque architects. Certainly there were more and this could expand further, but I think 
these were the, the six that I felt most important to document in the short amount of time. Um, and it's really important to understand, especially as contemporary, that these, you know, these architects really didn't have formal architectural training, um, and they come from different interests and different backgrounds, and those kind of motivate what I would say are their tropes and how can we start to tell the difference between all of these Baroque uh, architects and their architectural consequences. So in Rome, uh, there was uh, obviously Francesco Bormini, who is trained as a mason and a master builder. There's uh, Bernini, who is a child prodigy sculptor, so really comes at it from a sculptural uh, sensibility. Cortona um, is sort of the master painter, so his projects are painterly, quite literally. Um, Carlo Rinaldi is probably the closest to trained architects coming from the north, um, but it's interesting to see when he gets to Rome how these, um, all of these kind of mix together and sort of influence his. To the north, you know, but 100 years later, when the kind of economy shifts to Torino as, as kind of new capital, um, we have the work of uh, Guarini, who is, you know, really trained as a mathematician. And then further his further down, one of his pre predecessors, uh, Bernardo Vittoni, probably the least known of, of the six, but really amazing, is really uh, invested in light and I would call him the lumineer, really sort of opening up a lot of these uh, these projects as they kind of delaminate and really start to fill what typically was heavy and poche with light and other things as it kind of makes its way into the interior of these uh, these churches. So quick map, here's, you know, a number of the churches that are surveyed in Rome, which obviously took a while to, I mean, all of the survey really was done in a month and a half, which is uh, quite astonishing. I, you know, I think, you know, being on tenure track always is a motivator. But um, when I originally talked to Pharaoh, they agreed to lend me the, the laser scanner for surveying of one building for the month. And I was lucky to have contacts from previous um, uh, teaching in Italy and was able to gain access. So the big part of this research really that isn't visible is actually going to get permission to survey all of these churches. It takes quite a while um, and you really need to be on the ground and working every day to get permission because there's a number of different levels of permission you need for these churches. So, you know, a lot of the work was was just getting the permissions and not necessarily just being on the ground and surveying. I would say that actually the major part of the surveying happened in the kind of latter half of the month and a half. And then here's a, a map of Torino and some of the other churches that are off this map that are in the Piedmont area kind of surrounding Torino. So there's a few different types of what I would call novel representational techniques that come out of this survey. Um, and the first one I'm talking about is the paint, the, the painterly and the point cloud. So these are some of the results from that. Obviously the point cloud itself uh, is, is pretty fascinating where a lot of these scans, depending on how many different positions were taken and then composited together add up in the millions. So, you know, typically a church would have up to 16 million points. So San Carlino by Borromini uh, is here. So all of those points put together produced a really interesting way to see these interiors. And I would say a, a new way to see these interiors where you can view them from the exterior as an object, but also still see the interior. So kind of seeing the inside from the outside in this sort of uh, kind of a different diaphanous sort of bodies 
is really fascinating because you never really get to see them holistically in that sense. So these are some of those uh, representations that came from this one. Um, here is uh, San Luca y Mar uh, Martina from Cortona, his only kind of ground up full church. Here's Bernini's San Andrea that I was referring to as well. I mean, it's also really amazing that you are able to collect the color data as well. So that makes a huge difference when really starting to understand somebody like Bernini. Here's a few of Boromini's um, the Rimage and the Propaganda and San Carlo. Um, but this gives us kind of a new privileged view that we don't really get from visiting or um, from previous representations. And one of the things that I've enjoyed about this project is that the Baroque is, you know, is very complex, both formally, spatially, materially, and even the photography of it really never captures all of that together in one area. So these uh, kind of representations start to put all that together in a very interesting way and make it more accessible. There's a courtyard of, of San Carlino. Here's uh, Delori, which was one of the first scans that I did because now it's actually a private hotel and permissions were not as difficult uh, for this particular church than some of the others that are still really active and under different uh, jurisdictions. There's Rinaldi, a few Rinaldi projects. Guarini, Antonio. The Tony and uh, Torino, San Maria uh, di Piazza, which is amazing for all the different types of vaults that are contained within just this one church. And another thing that became fascinating once you acquire the scan data is that you no longer have to view it model with different viewpoints. So we start to see uh, these interiors from different vantage points. So here are some of those kind of views. And also, you know, some of, you know, really i was really fortunate to have some really great contacts these two are very difficult to access if you're just going to rome but you know borromini's rectilinear space at the oratory and then which is one of his earlier projects to one of his later projects a rectangle rectilinear space at um uh with the chapel of rimage at uh, the propaganda um kind of complex, you know, and you can start to see the evolution as an architect back and forth, but these are very, very difficult to access if you're just going to Rome. Looking at the nave of Capitelli by Rinaldi, really probably Rinaldi's masterpiece. and St. Ignazi uh, in Rome as well, which is kind of a hybrid church where Rinaldi Sr. started it. Borromini worked on the exterior primarily, but did do work on the interior. And then Rinaldi Jr. comes back and finishes the interior. So it really is quite interesting. Somebody like Deleuze would point out that this is uh, 
the epitome of the Baroque because the interior and the exterior don't really relate to one another. They both have their autonomy. And with this church, it's further accentuated because you have two different architects working on it. So Lorenzo by Guarini. Now, a third type of representation that came out of this is one of my favorites. And at the time, you know, and I think still it's it's pretty difficult to do in terms of high resolution. Um, how does one take what, a, you know, accounts for, you know, 15, 16 million points? And how do you generate a solid mesh from those? And at the time when I was doing this, we had really great relationship with Autodesk and Autodesk is investing uh, quite a bit to developing their reality capture and different aspects of that. And one of the projects Autodesk was working on is turning point clouds from scans into meshes. And they were doing that for uh, an engineering service that would survey oil platforms. And the reason why they needed a mesh was when they wanted to go back in and refit it with different infrastructure, they needed to have a mesh in order to uh, detect collisions. So they were working on a project and had set up cloud computing in order to put all the millions of points together for these oil platforms and was really thankful uh, that they allowed us to use that cloud uh, platform in order to start to send through these broke churches. And I think the people at Autodesk were really surprised to see these come in at the same time. At the time we were doing that, you know, it was really a black box kind of project where we would send it and have to wait for a few days. And sometimes we got nothing out of it. Other days we would kind of open it up and render it and just start to see these absolutely amazing uh, views of these kind of interior uh, spaces, you know, from the outside as just uh, pristine and uh, high fidelity objects. So these are some of the results coming back from the meshes. Again, you know, not like the point clouds, they're completely solid. But what's nice is that also the color is embedded within those meshes as well. You know, these meshes are very large. Uh, you know, they're all 50 gigs each. If one wanted to 3D print these at a one-to-one -one scale, you could completely reproduce these churches if that was the goal. But what you see from a kind of Baroque uh, sensibility is you see how there's a challenging of the central plan from the Renaissance where they didn't abandon it, but they start to challenge its centrality and its sort of static center by introducing new centers, multiple centers, this kind of distortion of it back and forth. San Carlino is kind of, you know, one of the poster childs of this with multiple new polar uh, centers put in and combined into one to get what was considered a surly and oval. Um, which allows a certain flexibility in the way that you draw that. San Ivo, obviously one of the few churches that has a plan that is not circular, that does not have pendentives. So typically if you have a cruciform plan, you resolve to the dome through the use of pendentives to transition from the two different geometries. Uh, Evo is really interesting because it has a complex plan and resolves into a dome or quasi dome without the use of pendentives. So it's all embodied within the kind of geometrical trans, uh, transition. Here are the two Boromini spaces that I was referring to previously the oratory and Rimage. It's really interesting to see. I mean, oratory had quite a complex situation in terms of what Boromini had come into and in trying to negotiate 
all the forces and from the exterior to the existing complex. Romage, you know, is more of a, I would call it a perfect work. It embodies the, the golden ratio, you know, on many, many levels. It's really a, a very perfect kind of calibrated church, but also it mixes ideas of Gothic, Renaissance, all of these things in one. It's really an amazing project. These are the twin churches, um, both begun and planned by Rinaldi. Um, the one on the right, Montesanto, was finished later by Bernini. The one on the left is entirely Rinaldi. And so you can start to see the differences of those interventions. Here's Rinaldi's Capitelli. Um, very interesting as a um, sort of combination of a number of elements that don't necessarily add up to a perfect whole. It's kind of a, uh, you know, it's a contested <laughs> um, uh, addition of parts to whole where it's almost a Frankenstein of these elements and they're brought together and stutured with a really strong cornice. There are a few others uh, by Rinaldi, Agnesi again. Um, really fascinating uh, how the colors are absorbed, but not only just the pure colors, but if you look over here where light is starting to come in, you can see it's sort of washed out at certain areas and other areas of the church have different lighting according to principles of caroscuro where certain parts of the church had greater lighting others were darker so that becomes to, uh, registered in these scans as well guarini uh, san lorenzo and immaculate conception kind of the area you know where some of these Baroque effects of the painterly that were previously done with, uh, you know, with painting and coppers start to become fully architectural and the sort of cupola becomes completely separated, allowing light in and with the kind of new structural logic. And here's Vittoni. Um, these, these are really interesting to me as far as scans because you start to get the figures of all of these delaminations. So um, like uh, Santa Chiara on the left, it doesn't actually look like this in reality, but what you're getting are the figures and the frescoes that the laser scanner can pick up as it kind of goes through the different perforations. And so these figures that end up on the side are the kind of layers of what you can actually see or what the laser scanner can see. And it sort of depicts it in a really interesting new way. And here's another Vittoni, uh, Santa Maria's Piazza, and just look at all the different types of vaults that are within just this one kind of project. And the fourth kind of representational technique that came out of this, again, probably you know, will definitely motivate it by um, the previous plaster molds um, that we saw, is the idea of can we then take these meshes and enclose them and actually 3D print the physical figures of them. So these uh, figures uh, are made from resin. They're 3D resin prints completely solid. The resin is supposed to be clear and totally transparent, but when it gains that kind of density, you start to see it has, you know, this deep bluish or purplish effect with those. And when I showed the Moretti earlier, the white plaster casts, which are fantastic, but you see in his modernist kind of streamlining of those, they don't have any of the articulation or the ornament or anything within them and they're completely solid. These do have those 
and maintain the ornament, the detail, and also they're transparent, so it highlights them a little bit differently. Here are photos of those, trying to photograph them in a similar way that Moretti did. And then they're pretty amazing as you actually light them and they start to um, illuminate in this way to kind of show a lot of the detail here. Um, Bernini San Andrea and his altarpiece, which is one of my favorite kind of areas where there's a lot of this kind of mixing between the architecture, the um, painting, and the sculpture all come together in this notion of bel composto where they're very hard to distinguish and pull out together and the resin models start to really show that in a fascinating way you can see also up in the dome it seems like there's areas where maybe the 3d printing messed up or errors but it really isn't this is actually that bel composto plaster angel figures that sit around the dome so they start to negotiate and stitch together or question some of the kind of orders of the architecture as well. So that work was then um, published in my book, Baroque Topologies, by Palombi Editoria, an Italian publisher, and came out in 2018 and and it was a great success you know it was you know a large volume of these churches that have never been seen in this way hopefully to kind of show them in a in a new way and and great um interest from different different audiences um but since that point i've also used that material and brought it into my baroque seminar where i teach here at penn and we've started to look at that with the students and kind of challenge them to say, you know, in the lineage of formal analysis um, that we, you know, we kind of have a first part of the semester where we kind of understand the Baroque, but we also understand the the lineage from Bolflin to um, a number of other figures all the way to, um, you know, Rowe, Vitkover, Eisenman, President Scott Cohen, I would say, putting these together, this kind of formal legacy of each one of those figures starts to take a kind of different discursive approach to close reading and formal analysis. Um, that's also influenced by their tools in which they kind of draw or interrogate these projects. So part of the goal of that seminar is to understand that history and to ask the students, now what do we do that we have this different form of representation with the LIDAR scan? How can we start to kind of add a new chapter to that? So some of the basic uh, outcomes of that is actually if you redraw the sections or plans or any of the kind of traditional documentation of these churches, they're quite different than what exists because a lot of them haven't been drawn from the as-built conditions. So this was an example of Campitelli, where it's actually drawn completely accurate to the scan, which looks very different than any of the kind of sections that you'll find that were typically drawn before the project was built and never kind of remeasured. Um, we're looking at you know these meshes and how we can understand those as figures a lot of students kind of working through typical analysis finding golden sections ratios geometrical analysis through those um, these were an exercise where we speculated that if uh, Schwazi would have continued his history books and included the baroque so these are very much motivated by the Schwazi worm's eye axons and kind of recreating that for the Baroque.
This is a series um, that one semester, and typically in the semesters, I ask the students, you know, we we have a, a debate and students will bring different examples of things that we can do representationally now with this material. This particular class decided that we wanted to make these kaleidoscopic um, images that showed all angles of the interior and all angles of the exterior of the interior together and they're completely oblique projections meaning there's no perspectival distortion on these as well so these are a series of these kind of kaleidoscopic uh, obliques with uh, each one of the churches so guarini and batoni And you can see the other figures um, here, Boromini, San Carlino, Oratory by Boromini, Delori by Boromini, Evo by Boromini. Um, these two are Bernini, so San Andrea, and then uh, another church that's just slightly outside of uh, Rome in Ariccia. Other figures here, um, another Bormini, uh, Rimage, Agnesi. Here we get the two twin churches by Rinaldi. Rinaldi again with Campitelli, and then two Vittonis and one Guarini. Or, yes. Uh, another semester, same exercise, students decided that they wanted to work with these interiors and take the models and start to unfold them. So how could they start to unfold the entire interior to sort of map it out and show it as one drawing with these meshes? And um, it was a really interesting process where students were having to decide where and how they want it to kind of cut the meshes and start to rotate and hinge them in certain ways. Also, in terms of the colors that you see here are not the original colors of the church. We actually were looking at ways to analyze where curvature, curvature and articulation occur within these churches. So we rendered it with a gradient where the kind of bluish that you see has zero curvature or the most flat, and then those areas that have the higher articulation, um, such as um, in Bernini's case with the plaster um, uh, garlands and these kind of things, or the fluted pilasters, those become the other end of the spectrum, which are orange. So it's really a mapping of the articulation within these churches and an unfolding of the interiors. So this became a consistent series of taking the entire collection and working to make that representation uniform across the collection too. So it's the notion of a survey is at one point the actual act of surveying and measuring a building, but there's also the idea of a survey as a collection as well. So we try to um, document the entire survey in the same way each semester with these kind of, so we can start to look at these all together through the same lens. And some of them, you know, they require, you know, quite a bit of decision making about how students want to unfold this. We kind of had a rule that we wanted to keep all pieces of the interior within the same drawing. So you see some sides of the churches are then are kind of flipped and mirrored. Um, certain uh, ends are situated at one bottom of the drawing and on the upper level. So they kind of are a little bit um, bipolar in the way they represent uh, these kind of flip over 
and start to do that. So it's a really kind of interesting exercise of unrolling and unwrapping these high uh, high definition interior meshes. So I'm not sure about the time, but I'll go through these pretty quickly. But one of the things that's really interesting is then students really look at the tropes of these architects and how they're different from one another using the scan material. And I'm going to get through these pretty quickly. But Cortona, like we was saying in the beginning, uh, you know, really comes from it from a painterly way. And if you understand that, then you can understand that the um, church you know, completely is on different layers, just in the way he would use layers in his perspective, right? And so this is San Luca, it's one church and students kind of going through and finding all those layers and just exploding those meshes to kind of demonstrate how many layers there are in relationship to his approach to painting, which produces these layers of depth as well. Rinaldi, like I said before, you know, um, very interesting figure. Um, he has this these disparate parts that are kind of, uh, you know, I would say don't necessarily go together proportionally. It's a bit of a Frankenstein and add up to a, a difficult whole, which questions idea of perfection. Um, so these students kind of took, the, took all of the the cornices out that stitch them together and start to put those larger elements back together within this so you can start to understand how Rinaldi, Rinaldi operates a little bit more differently than other architects and that sort of grew into um, what we call Rinaldi's labyrinth. So these are the type of drawings and analysis that we're producing out of the seminar which are the purpose is really just to have a closer reading kind of understanding of this work right through these architectural analytical models this is another one of rinaldi taking apart all those pieces recompositing them in different ways to start to understand how many pieces and elements are really at play within those interiors more Rinaldi analysis. Bernini, like earlier we're talking about, comes from a sculptural aspect, really only had three ground up whole projects from, uh, you know, as churches really didn't do that much architecture per se, he did a lot of altars, a lot of pieces of sculpture, but the three churches, um, that he had is, uh, you know, um, we're all scanned in the survey. So these students took on that and they took on this notion of bel composto, which is the kind of perfect mix, mixing of the arts of architecture, sculpture, and painting. So they started to look at different areas of those three Bernini, Bernini churches and started to pull out different elements of these kind of bel compostos. Uh, uh, a lot of the plaster figures and they started to look at when you put those back together how can they challenge certain thresholds and certain ideas just in simple geometries and so these are some of the results of of those kind of plaster pieces all reconfigured in one piece from those three churches more Bernini analysis, um, looking at similar ideas um, with the two kind of domes uh, in Castle Gandolfo and the Arici Church, bringing in other figures from San Andrea as well. Different approach to Bernini. Uh, this one was using some AI uh, approaches to multiply that this kind of bel composto even more than it is. So, you know, in this amazing altarpiece in San Andrea where you have angels and cherubs just 
filling and spilling through that um, oculus onto the painting, onto the architecture. It's multiplied even more <laughs> here to kind of highlight that. So again, I think these are different types of models and different types of drawings than could have been done previously without the scan that gives you the high resolution, gives you the the complete figuration and also all of the colors and material richness. And I think the students are then beginning to work with that in a completely new way than was possible before to essentially generate a better understanding about how these architects are operating differently than one another as they're kind of tropes. For Amini, um, certainly uh, geometry, you know, he's an architect's favorite, um, uh, probably the most complex in terms of geometry, maybe next to Guarini as a mathematician. Uh, these students were looking at hybridizing different polar geometries from the three kind of major churches, San Carlino, San Ivo, Rimage, and then looking at different ways in which they could take those sort of bays and create hybrid models of those. Um, this project was looking at the ordering system of Boromini's pilasters, which, you know, uh, has some interesting AB, AB rhythms. And this was taking all of those from those main sequences and kind of understanding those figure ground relationships that they produce. And then even though we talk about Bernini mostly as the sculptor, you know, Borromini has elements that are binary all throughout his work. And they're always kind of pushing, pulling, kind of pushing on, off, push, pull. So these students went through and registered all those elements. So uh, ionic capitals have different volutes at different uh, direction. Um, certain uh, balustrades have different uh, orientation with, you know, thicker, lower, higher, kind of a, a trick he took from Michelangelo. Uh, you know, certain niches are on, off, up, down. Angels, wings are open, closed, open, closed. Vaulting is kind of pushing up, down, back and forth. And so taking all of those elements and <laughs> combining them into this sort of hybrid model to show all of those kind of Boromini elements together in one. Guarini, uh, like I said before, uh, is a mathematician. You know, a little bit different approach to Boromini, but I think there certainly are similarities. Um, everything that Guarini did was extremely polar and it was about these spheres pushing and pulling on one another. These are different ways in which students start to take apart um, San Lorenzo and start to rotate them in relationship to those polar centers and kind of unfold the interiors on these kind of hinges uh, that exist within the original interior. And finally, last, uh, Vitoni and these kind of delaminated vaults, which were um, really fascinating. Uh, they're, they're super, super thin. You know, at the time, yeah, I mean, if you look at the survey, this is the work, it's the latest, you know, in the Baroque. And, you know, the structure is starting to become, even though it's still load bearing, the masonry is very thin and allowing all of these bolts to be nested and exist uh together so these are a series of volt objects that start to show that uh taxonomy within the tony's work you see here uh certain areas where he will pierce pendentives so pendentives are typically solid but at this point they're light enough where it can actually poke holes through them and bring light through a very uh, kind of a very specific trope of Petoni.
and these are some hybrid models that are kind of taking those vaults apart and all the kind of the tonies starting to amplify and, and magnify those. Then other students looked at this in terms of hybrid approaches, not just one uh, architecture church being analyzed. This one student uh, took all the cupolas and started to mix and merge the points and then remesh them together. So depending on different weights of points from different authors, uh, you get some interesting kind of hybrid domes that have elements of all of them together. These are some additional kind of chunk objects as we would call them where looking at different objects from each architect as well and putting them together in different ways. This student wanted to make new churches uh, from all the pieces of the others and took that all the way into making new plans and also new names and for the churches and the architects as well took that narrative all the way through so you get interesting new hybrids or possible baroque churches that never existed i'm not sure how we're doing on time but i sure the last time i ran this course um we decided that we wanted to kind of return to the points. A lot of the previous work had been done with the meshes and really want to see can we operate on the points in a, in a different way. So in this, I was really happy to kind of return to a lot of the original scans because you have the original colors in those. And we worked um, with uh, point uh, cloud software. We happen to work with Houdini in this case and also introduce ideas of forces that then could start to manipulate and reconfigure those points and colors. Um, it was a interesting exercise. I mean, it's actually, you know, quite computationally heavy and it's a lot to kind of move through. But what we settled on at the end is that each student was doing kind of a series of basically four drawings where they were trying to keep certain identifiable features of the church intact, such as cornices or altars, and letting other kind of points be a little bit more free to kind of highlight or frame those pieces. So we had sort of a cornice drawing, altar drawing, these kind of things. So this is some of the work that comes from, from that uh, particular way of looking now back at the points. So this is Bernini's in Areccia. This is a, another uh, Bernini in, um, in Castle Gandolfo, which is the Pope's sort of summer residence slightly outside of Rome. Um, fascinating kind of altar piece, you know, put together sort of quintessential Bernini bel composto, but now at even more hyper agitation of that. Bernini San Andrea. Bormini San Ivo. So you can see here trying to keep the signature cornice that reflects the plan and dome pieces and then letting others kind of start to fray and and frame that. An interesting thing is that you know when you scan you really are only getting a surface. You're never getting any depth. So both the meshes and the point cloud are very thin. You know, they have no materiality. Um, one of the things that I enjoyed about this, you know, in addition to it just being another way to kind of look closely, interrogate these projects, um, is it starts to build volume and this new kind of poche out of points. Um, so that sort of thinness is, is kind of challenged from the scans.
San Carlino and certain figures alter here. I mean, even though Borromini wasn't really known uh, for color, typically it's monolithic, white plaster, these kind of things, maybe some gold. It's actually really interesting to see the colors that come from these scans, some of these kind of purplies and other things because of the different way in which the light is registered within uh, these churches when trying to balance the light uniformly, which is kind of a the mechanism of the scanner to try to get an even balance. But because these churches have different levels of light in different areas, you get a lot of this, um, this kind of residue, which I, I find fascinating, becomes very colorful. San Colino Courtyard. is uh, Bernini's oratory. Romaggi by Bormini. Delori. I really like some of the edges of these kind of pieces, how so they like, no longer are thin. It sort of plays an interesting game that creates even more illusion of thickness around it. And this is Cortona. This is actually Cortona's ceiling from Palazzo uh, Barberina, Barberini, which I was able to scan in a recent trip back. So it was nice to kind of just work on that with the colors in uh, his masterpiece. Rinaldi, again, you're getting the sort of richness of those colors from the marble, starting to mix with the richness of the colors of the frescoes. Um, and then those kind of strong features of both the columns and um, uh, different uh, architectural elements, um, strong cornice, these kind of things remain stable and other points are allowed to bleed into others around this. Uh, Rinaldi Capitelli. Rinaldi's Twin Churches. Another kind of minor Rinaldi, uh, you know, first century kind of Roman church in origins, but again, really incredible colors range that comes out of that. Guarini's San Lorenzo, Guarini Immaculate Conception. San Maria uh, Piazza by Bittoni. Uh, San Chiara by Bittoni. Again, you start to see a lot of that delamination uh, in between vaults. So some vaults were kept pretty solid and other vaults are allowed to start to disintegrate and come through. And, and I think that's all that I have really for today. I have to say, you know, the, the point clouds were a really interesting way to approach it. Um, I think probably maybe the, the more radical in terms of dealing with those, even though they're a little bit more difficult to precisely kind of nail down what's at stake in terms of both formal analysis and geometry. They've been really, uh, you know, for me, eye-opening and a lot of fun to go get those elements and really try to showcase them. So anyway, um, I think that's it for me. Santiago, are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm here. Um, 
if you want, you can keep uh, sharing uh, so we can go through some of the images. Uh, I had to say that the presentation was as overwhelming as the as the topic of the Baroque. So it's quite incredible to see all this material together. Um, I have a lot of a uh, lot of questions, a lot of comments, but I will try to reduce them as much as I can. I know also that we had some trouble in the streaming, so I may, we'll make sure that we're going to post the the entire uncut uh, version of your presentation, so it is it is accessible for everyone online. But um, let me just uh, start with some questions. And again, uh, if you can, you can post it on the YouTube chat, uh, and I will read them to him. So um, what to say? It's a lot of work. It's a lot of years of work. Uh, it's, it's amazing. I, I will start with an idea that I think it's uh, some authors have talked about, and I've been thinking about that.